The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callahan Innovation. Here's your host, Simon Powell. News hit recently that a small New Zealand TV production company had sold a format to Fremantle Media, who are an enormous TV company around the world. This is uh, big news at any time, but it's really the the coolest thing is that it's a show called Sidewalk Karaoke that hails from Mouldy Television. To people watching the people who make the TV though, this was no surprise, as the owner of that production company, Bailey Mackey, is a producer responsible for a string of really interesting and innovative shows like Code on Mouldy Television, through to the GC, a ratings hit, and uh, about 20 other pieces of, uh, of TV that he's made happen. In typical fashion, that isn't even his biggest news at the moment, as he's also built and launched a TV production company cloud management software tech product called Kaha, and has customers and good news happening all around the world. To chat about the business of making and selling ideas globally, Bailey joins us now. Kia ora Bailey, um, tell us, how did you first get your start making television? That's a really interesting one. I guess probably for me, and kia ora by the way Simon, is that um, it is Māori Language Week, so I I guess uh, we should acknowledge that because that's a really... um, probably a good place for me to start. I started out in Iwi Radio in, in Ruatoria and population 300. So uh, uh, for me, it wasn't so much I started in TV but started in broadcasting and, you know, had an instant affinity. Um, I love radio and um, I hope one day I'll be able to go back because it's such an intimate medium. And so that's where I first sort of got a taste of broadcasting. I then, um, an auntie of mine encouraged me to apply for a job on Te Karere. And interesting story, I got a um, uh, 22 people uh, submitted their CV. So I got a phone call and said that my CV was ranked 17th. But I wrote a really creative cover letter and uh, they gave me an interview um, but said that you know they were flying the other people in. I had to make my own way to Auckland. And I hitchhiked up and, and ended up uh, getting the job. I started at Te Karere and then... I went from Te Karere, 10 months there, and I got a random phone call from Mal Reed at TV3. Um, she'd just seen a story I did on Te Karere and, and um, offered me a job uh, to go across to 3 News. And um, I started in the sports department, and that, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I sort of got my first foray into TV um, at Te Karere, but I, I, I think I really grew when I was at TV3, because... I had some of the best in the business, you know, people like John Campbell and, um, you know, in a sports sense, Clint Brown and Hamish Mackay, Rachel Smalley, Michelle Pickles, um, people that were all fantastic uh, craftspeople. And, and um, you know, I, I, I'm a genuine believer, you're a storyteller or you're not. 
and then I, I, I guess, you know, I've, I've always been a storyteller, which is probably good and bad, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but then, you know, started being given the tools, you know, of the trade and started understanding TV a lot more so. Yeah, how old were you when you first came out? And what was the Iwi radio station? Because I've listened oh, to uh, yeah. Uawa FM um, yeah, yeah. in Tolaga Bay and uh, yeah, Uwa, well, yeah. Radio Ngati Pro. Yeah, radio yeah, Ngati which is Pro. which is just up the road from uh, Tolaga. So Uawa FM eighty eight point five, um, and Radio Ngati Pro is five eighty five AM. So. If you're listening on the East yeah, Coast, yeah, that's uh, it. That's tune, it. tune in. And, and is that where the beginning of that storytelling came from? Uh, no, well, mate, I, I think my storytelling started uh, 2,000 years ago, you know, when when uh, I guess my ancestors uh, left uh, Hawaii and, and um, you know, it's well known that we're an oral people. Um, we don't have a, a whole lot of a written history, so... I think it's intergenerational. I like to think that, you know, I'm quite spiritual in that regard and think that there are higher forces and, and things like that. So I, I guess for me, um, it is something that started a while ago. And, and I just, uh, <clears throat> you know, have been able to, to, to craft it and, and make it appropriate to whatever medium I've worked in, rather be radio and uh, obviously in recent, more recent times TV and, and, and now digital too, so... Yeah, and, and you started uh, in um, broadcast and television broadcast on uh, Māori story uh, platforms, but it was really um, in the sports and then with the birth of Māori television where you were able to create formats and make things in the sports realm. Uh, is that where you got your first kind of taste of actually um, spinning up your own idea and making it work? Yeah, well, I, I, that is really interesting because I did come from the Māori language side of the fence and... I guess when I sort of went into TVNZ and then in TV3, it, it always amazed me that a lot of my um, contemporaries, Māori contemporaries, kind of um, sort of were on the outside. Like, you know, in a figurative sense, it was more like, oh, that's mainstream, that's not us. Um, and, you know, I was always like, why, why isn't it us? You know, didn't really know what, you know, and I was like, we need to be in there mixing it up and... And so I'm always a believer that, um, you know, once you're armed with the skills, if, like, and, and you're Māori, you know, we have such a richness of culture and a her of heritage that we, you know, immediately we're kind of, you know, you know we, we, we have a different factor about us, you know, the UMF, the unique Māori factor. And then I went from TV3 to Shortland Street. I did a stint writing. It was actually pretty bad, to be frank. Um, <laughs> I don't mind. I'm sure I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but um, I went out there as the Maori advisor, did a bit of writing, and and then after that, I went across to Maori TV as head of sport. And you know, Maori TV when it launched was incredible because you know it was one of those organisations you were able to sort of write the script as you were going along, and it, and in those kind of environments, you know, necessity often um, determines innovation, and you're just allowed to experiment, you know. And we we one of the big shows I. I did it, Māori TV was code, and, and it was a really simple format and things like that. And I always say to people, you know, the first year no one watched it, so it didn't matter what we put on, you know. We would have fun in the credits by putting stupid, the most stupid things and seeing if we got any complaints. <laughs> like, really? Is anyone that, watching? That's right. That, Is anyone out there? That's yeah. right. Really bad shit. Like, you know, it's like... We should have got a complaint. <laughs> so, and and um, so, you know, but, but it just allowed me to hone my skills. And, you know, I spent hours in studios and, and hours out, you know, on multi-camera OBs and, and things like that. And, and, uh, but it was an amazing environment. I spent, spent quite a lot of time making TV that no one watched, um, earnest media shows and earnest politics shows, and it's uh, earnest shows about kids' music, you know, all of those things that, you know, you, you, when there's no one watching uh, or a very small audience, but you've still got great New Zealand on air support or, or funding body support, you can do interesting things. Yeah, and, you know, this will surprise a lot of people. My tastes are a lot more earnest than people might think, you know, like a. Obviously, we'll talk about the GC, but I'm actually my favourite show is Country Calendar, mm. and um, I love a lot of the you know the public service programming. Um, I, I probably watch more of it than I do of a lot of the prime time stuff. Even though you know I make prime time stuff myself when I 
choose to watch TV for enjoyment, you know. And then, um, so, but I'm the same as you. And But at the end of the day, you know, it, it's an incredibly tough business. Mm. And it's tough from the point of view that, you know, you put your heart and soul into everything and then you put it out there. And I always say to people, like, it's like putting your undies on the line. <laughs> and it's like, are they clean? You know, and it's like, uh, um, yeah. it's a tough place to be. And, you know, we're all human and, you, you know, criticism hurts. We all want people to love what we do. Um, and that's not always going to be the case. And and I love social media for that. Like, a lot of people will say, oh, social media is like, oh, don't worry about the trolls and things like that. It's like, you know what? We, we, we put things out. Why aren't the public allowed to write a return? Yeah. And, and I actually think... Um, you know, I think there's real validity in, in it. Whether you choose to engage in it, I know people who don't. Sometimes I do take a sneaky look. You yeah, know? Yeah. I try to tell people, oh, no, I don't worry about people, what they say. But I'll have a sneaky little search of a show that I've made and, and go through all the comments. So... No. Should, should we should we jump forward to the um, to the GC there yep. because um, you, you know that was a, a, a huge production um, prime time hit yeah. and it was a really interesting thing as well because it actually wrapped up a lot of interesting messages about uh, successful Maori living their lives and just doing their thing uh, and if people stuck with the show past the first episode they ended up seeing quite a bit of interesting stuff that you wouldn't have expected from the top. It was a bit of a Trojan horse. No, and I'm really glad you said that because I, I, I always say to people like they criticise it, well, you know, did you watch the whole series? Did you did you follow, um, you know, uh, Tweenie's arc when she went back to her marae? Did you uh, really understand what was going on in that whangai storyline around Jade Louise and the power of whangai? And, yeah, I guess... Um, you know, the first episode probably portrayed it. And, and kept, you know, what I what I like, though, is in, in any art, and I, I'm not necessarily <laughs> saying GC's the art, yeah. but, but as artists or as creators or as content aggregators, our role is to challenge as well. And, you know, uh, you, I'll see a piece of Michael Parikofi, a sculpture, I think, wow, that's amazing. And, and sometimes it's really challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, for me... The thing was, was you, you might not have liked it, and a shitload of people didn't. Um, and for me, though, what it did, it forced you to have an opinion on it. And it was the ultimate, at the time, it was the ultimate dinner conversation piece because everybody had an opinion on it. And you know, I like to think that um, that uh, you know that at its heart were these a bunch of kids that were um, trying to achieve their dreams and. And things like that, but you know, it, again, um, you take the good with the bad, and and you, and you got to be able to roll with the punches. You know, again, we're human, so that does impact on things. I, I guess the hardest part of that kind of storm is is just how it affects people around you, your kids, yeah, yeah. Your, you know, your, your your kids go to school and say, "Oh, old man made that shit show." <laughs> it's like the hell of disgrace, you know, like and. Uh, and, you know, so I, my kids were too young at the time, I guess, but, you know, so I'm not sure I'll do another show like that in the near future, though, because they're at an age where they probably take a lot of that in. So the, 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 Let's jump back a little bit to how you got out on your own in the business side of things, because I guess in an environment like Maldi Television, where you were making up the rules yourself, mm. it's that entrepreneurial streak. And also something that is interesting about TV is, you have to work to a budget. You yeah. have to actually have profit lines. You have yep. to know about deadlines. You've got a product. You've got an audience. You're selling stuff. So you're kind of already in business before you set out. Um, yeah. But, you know, what, what was it that took you into um, doing things for yourself? I, I guess um, I probably hit a ceiling at Maldi TV. Um, we had an, I had an awesome boss when I was there, Jim Mather, um, who's now the CEO at Te Wānau and Aotearoa. He was really good at fostering entrepreneurship or, you know, his thing was, was uh, to use a rugby analogy, I've picked you, now go out and play well. And um, he he was really good around giving us the parameters, you know, this is the, the, this is the boundary and this is what you've got to come up with. So I was really fortunate, I guess, I had someone who recognised in me uh, that I had talent um, and... But but I'd kind of hit a ceiling there as well. Like, you know, we'd won awards. Um, we'd actually started rating well. Um, and, you know, I think it was just time to leave. So it was just one of those natural 
amicable sort of partying of ways and then I just kind of went out and I had five really awesome balls in the air that I was juggling and and as business goes all five fell on my head and uh, it was in a really important time and what happened was I actually ended up eating humble pie and having to go back and pick up part-time work in the weekends at Māori TV you know after being a, a high performer at MTS and um trying to get gigs up you know I thought I'd had lined up and stuff and and yeah it was some tough times you know like I, I remember that I was really on the verge of sort of taking another full-time job again like just reporting on the news I was doing a little bit of freelancing on prime news and um I was doing a little bit of Maori advising for a couple of productions and just to make ends meet but they were tough but it, it really taught me I guess to I'm a big believer you, you, you've got to manage your success as well as your failures. We all know that failure is uh, an important part of biz- business and how you embrace and react to that. But things, I was on a high when I left Māori TV and I had all these balls in the air, but they all kind of fell on my head. And uh, so that was a really um, important lesson, I guess, around humility, but also, um, you know, that you really need to manage the, those high times as well. Yeah, and part of being a producer and a company owner and, you know, when you're the the CEO and the cleaner at the company, you know, you're yeah. doing everything yourself, is that ability to take stuff on. But um, it's also very hard when you're going from project to project to yeah. be able to plan with staff and the like. Like, how yeah. did you start to build build and, and, and learn about that kind of side of business? Well, randomly, I got a phone call from Julie Christie, um, who's obviously a well-known producer in New Zealand. Um and she was looking to do a project, a reality project um, called, it was called Te Pai at the time, but it ended up being called One Land, where it was, we took three families back to 1850, effectively, and two Māori and one Pākehā, um, and we built a pa site uh, about an hour out of Auckland. Fantastic project. And she, she needed a Māori producer, and I think she had an option of a couple more senior people or someone that was younger and, and she gave me a call, and and we we did that project, and it was coming to an end. And I started juggling balls again, like, oh, geez, I need another gig. Um, what am I going to do? And um, Julie said to me, um, you know, why don't we, you know, why don't I put up the money and and I back uh, a new company of yours, and you concentrate on what you do. Um, so literally overnight, I got the business structure and obviously her incredible business acumen um, to back, um, you know, what I wanted to do. And then uh, we went from that and we did a show called Hip Hop High and then we did a show called Mind Your Language and then we did a sh- Like, I think all told, we over four and a half years, we probably did 20 shows. Yeah. 22 shows. And, and you know, the life and times of Tim Weta Morrison – um, saving Gen Y for TV3. Some of these... History of Māori Rugby. History of Māori Rugby, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, beneath the Māori Moon. Actually, that might have been one of the first ones as yeah, well. Like, yeah. And so... And, and that, you know, like um, these shows, if people didn't didn't catch them, you know, like uh, that one, be, be, uh, the Beneath the Māori, Māori Moon. moon yeah, yeah, Beneath the Māori Moon. That had... Um, it was incredibly ambitious. There were yeah. um, huge reproductions of like... <laughs> uh, of, of, of games and battle scenes. That's and, like, right, that's yeah, right. Yeah, it was and, and for... Uh, a really minute around, budget, yes, to be frank. But, interviews um, all around the country, archive all footage. All around the world. Yeah. Yeah, uh, archive footage and, and um, you know, like I look back, there's not many shows, like I don't, you know, I was, I'm a believer that you only have so many shows in you as a producer. I've made pretty much everything I've wanted to make. I've made something on rugby. I've made something um, that was a massive rater. I've made you know, something with Tim Morrison. I've actually made four things with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now you've um, you've sold a format. So yeah. the big news recently is Fremantle coming on and picking up um, Sidewalk Karaoke, which, tell us about that format and how you got that off the ground. Yeah, well, like I said, I was with um, uh, Black Ink, which was the show backed by Julie, uh, iWorks, which was Julie's company. And then uh, about two and a half, nearly three years ago now, I set up my own company, Pango, and we. one of the first ideas I had under it um, was a show called Karaoke Cab. And uh, I was uh, a, a believer that, like, man, um, you know, I could see what Humai Te Pakipaki had done for Māori TV, 
and thought that I could reduplicate that magic in a cab. Anyway, we tried to shoot something with it, and it just didn't quite work. Like low energy, um, you know, it was only the cab driver and the contestant. And then um, a mate of mine, um, actually from America, out of LA, said, "Why don't you pull it all out of the taxi?" And then I was like, "Wow, great idea!" So we pulled it out of the taxi, had the exact same setup, changed it from uh, karaoke cab to sidewalk karaoke, <laughs> and shot um, some sizzle, uh, like a little pilot thing, and then sent it out to all the networks. And, you know, had quite a bit of interest, and and Multi TV came back, and and we did a deal, and and then I I attend um, MIPCOM and MIP TV which are in April and October every year in Cannes. And it's the big TV market. And I took it, firstly, I took it last October, and and we got quite a bit of interest, like a lot more than we thought we would. And then this April, because it had gone to air, um, we got a lot more interest. And, mate, there was a, I don't mind saying this, but there was like a bidding war between three global companies. And, and, um it was an incredibly exciting period, you know, to go through a sort of four or five week period where, you know, you're being fettered by some of the biggest media companies in the world. And, and, um, cause they are, I mean, free, free well, are like huge. the biggest. Yeah. 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 So it was, um, you know, it was an incredibly difficult posi- uh, position to be in because, you know, you, you kind of think, Oh, these guys are really nice guys or these, you know, these people can do. We're at a restaurant in the Riviera. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Mate, restaurant in the Riviera, restaurant in LA and Hollywood, and yeah. things like that. So you know, we went through a, a considerable process before, I guess, partnering up with Fremantle, and and you know, it's been awesome because it's just you know, I, I understand what it, it must be like going from the minor leagues to the major leagues in baseball, or, or making the NBA because these guys are on another level in terms of just how they roll things out and you know we'll have a conference call and there's 12 countries online you know in terms of the different parts of the world and different departments and and um things like that so i'm 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 i'm, I'm enjoying that ride like yeah, it's an incredible cool. place to be in well, well, what does it mean for you bailey does that mean that um you keep working with them on this format or are they going to have a look at your back catalogue or are you going to develop new stuff with them or is, yeah. it, is it a great new door that's yeah, open yeah i think a Probably a little bit of all of those, mm. Simon, um, because as you understand, um, one of the things is you don't want to be a one-hit wonder, so we've, we're trying to follow that up with something else, And um, but we, um, what it does mean is that they do, you know, it does mean that we become a lot more attractive to a potential overseas, um, you know, for an acquisition. It also means that new doors are open, um, that you know we have a lot more credibility when we um, talk to um, people when we pitch overseas. You know because for me, one I think you know New Zealand is a country and uh, has an economy that's been largely built on the primary sector. But I think our most underutilized areas is uh, our IP. You know and and our ideas and our people. You know there's that old saying. What's the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata, and that it's people. And I think that it's our human resource that gives us the edge. Um, even though I think you know we've got fantastic activity in the agriculture sector and things like that, I I definitely think that the new knowledge economy and and, and technology plays a, a massive role in that um, will will become important in the next few years. Just just to close off that point, actually, like I think it's actually like one of the coolest things out of that because that's a that's a huge coup for any business. But the fact that you can take an idea that is on a station that is a small station in this country and sell it to the world's biggest um, media company uh, is such a cool thing, and it just shows that you know a good idea with the right execution can come from anywhere in the world and then and then go to the top, which is which is quite a cool thing to have seen through. That's right. And and I think that um, you know, people like Julie Christie and that have done it previously out of New Zealand. Um it hasn't been it's been a while though since um something has I guess risen up out of here. But the um the interesting part is you are right, is that that's the thing that I'm most proud of is that, you know, it's a sh- a show that's on our indigenous broadcaster, um and Mate, I, I was in a meeting and I, 
in LA um, at the Fremont Hotel in Santa Monica at Real Screen USA, which is a big conference. Um, probably about four or five hundred of the most powerful people in Hollywood are at this conference. And I sat across the table from Sally Ann Salsano, who makes Jersey Shore, and she was in raptures over sidewalk karaoke and telling me how much she loved it and things like that. And we'll partner up with her on it in the US. And, you know, it was an incredibly proud moment, like, to sit there and think, wow, you know, I'd, I'd, I, I, I obviously knew who Sally Ann Salsano was and from her success. And just to sit there and think, wow, here we are talking about this little... Um, yeah. Moldy TV show. Well, that came off the back of making twenty shows <laughs> in a very short amount of time. It did, mate. Working like crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some good, some yeah. bad. Yeah. So you just, yeah. And and to talk about that technology piece because you know part of what um, like TV especially you know like not only have you got to run a business but you've got to come up with the freshest ideas you've got to come up with stuff mm. that's like a consumer product and you've got to run like a smooth operation so yeah. there's quite a lot of or else like the good crew they just won't they just won't come near you if that's you right. don't give them a good so so to tell me about like the things that you've innovated in there yeah well I guess you, what's interesting is I always say to people that you know. Content creation is an incredibly blurred business. Anything that relies on creativity has blurry lines. What isn't blurry are financials and contracts. And so about a year ago, or probably 18 months ago now, and this is, you'll laugh at this given the recent success of Saito Karaoke, I was like, man, I don't know how much juice the old production business has got left in it. <laughs> like, margins are smaller, you know, um, like it's it's just incredibly tough times you know the market's incredibly fragmented in terms of viewership and audience so um i was like well we're somewhere else in our business that we could perhaps concentrate our efforts on for a while and it always amazed me that in production you could never pause a production and get an accurate financial snapshot of where you were at any given time so we really as an industry who prides itself on creativity and innovation we always pride out we're, uh, we're incredibly manual behind the scenes you know on a on any given production you have a, a budget that might be xl or it could be a movie magic or you you have a schedule that might be xl or it could even be a word doc you'll have contact um, list you'll have database you have all these different um parts of your production so what we've built is a system uh, solution called kaha um, and, and again, like pango, um, th- these are mouldy words. So, you know, um, uh, <laughs> sidewalk karaoke created by pango. Pango is a mouldy word for black. It's our national colour. And, you know, two of our shareholders are former All Blacks, Rico and Jose Gear. And so when we were looking for a name, I was like, well, what about pango? You know, it's our national colour and it's got a bit of a story to it. And we were like, yeah, you know, why not? The same with kaha. What we've built is an incredibly powerful system, and we know kaha is the Māori word for strong or powerful. So, uh, And we've had that um, feedback through validation out of Los Angeles and things like that. So it's effectively an interface between budget, schedule, um, booking, and crew, but it, but it allows you to do things like cash flow. Um, you know, it's cloud-based, it's multi-platform, and... And we've got our first uh, U.S. customers to go with our first Australian customers and, and, and um, you know, a, a, a few Kiwi customers. But the aim is, is we've definitely built it for Hollywood um, because in a lot of ways, and anyone who's spent a lot of time in America will be testament to this, is America on a lot of levels, like I always say to people, the, most fi- the, the, the top end 5% of America is the most advanced in the world. The 95% below that... Is, a, is, is not so advanced, to say it in a nice way. And what we've done is we've realised that, there, that there's a whole lot of lack. There's a lack of automation. You go to the doctor, um, you, you can't suddenly bring up your records anywhere. Um, mate, they're still cutting checks. They still write a check. You know, you're still paid by check with a check and, and things like that. So, you know, we've, you know, they say time is everything. Um We've just hit the market um, and we're going incredibly well. And, you know, we've got one massive opportunity um, on at the moment that we're, we, we, we're just working our way through that could be an incredible game changer for us. So That's so cool. So, like, on the edge of, like, having – because, you know, when you were saying before you juggle lots of balls in production – 
that is, you know, at, at any one time you might be like reporting to the New Zealand on air um, who are extremely <laughs> diligent on their reporting. And you've are they a, fantastic, they, New they Zealand are, on air? They, do they? They are. They are fantastic, and they get you into very, very good disciplines, um, having to report for every single dollar on a production <laughs> and stuff. But you know, so so you're doing some really serious accounts, and you're you're pitching five ideas, and you're seeing through production another three, and then you just spun off like a tech cloud product for management for production companies that's that's pretty awesome yeah i, I guess you know it's that whole thing of necessity um dictates uh innovation i guess you know we, uh, it was an attempt to probably foolproof our future a little like you know we, we didn't have a gig on for three or four weeks and you know it's like well you know we can do an incredible amount of things in that time so you know we 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 developed it we've got our own in-house team um yeah, I mean, you'll be testament, you know, you've gone a similar path as well, you know, production and, and tech too. So you, you see where there's overlap, you see there, where there's incredible differences. Um, but I love tech and, and um, I, I've definitely, le- there's some parts of the whole tech uh, ethos and methodologies that frustrate me, but there, I think that um, production could learn, you know, yeah. a lot from um, technology and just the methodologies. They have some really amazing advanced methodologies, you know, things like Agile, Scrum, um, Kanban, um, Lean, you know, all of these, um, you know, you don't, there are no none of that and there's no methodology no. in production. No. It, it's hierarchical, it's waterfall and, you know, it's made me understand, uh, you know, just, I guess, how not backwards, but oh yeah, yeah how yeah when, when, backwards. When I when I came out of uh, traditional media and traditional uh, advertising into tech, you know, you come in and you're all like, you know, waving your arms around, you just got to sell the idea once, and then you, you know, like when you have a failure in advertising or yeah. TV. No yeah. one ever talks about it. Like yeah. I've talked on whole channels that got yeah. shut down, and everyone yeah. just doesn't mention it. And like you yeah. move on to the next thing that you hope will be successful. While in tech, you have a big retrospective yeah. that looks at every contributing factor to it not working, and everything you can learn to change for next time. That's right. So you get better. And even the idea, like going back as a TV producer, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go back and like improve stuff you've made before and that is what tech is about yeah i i think that that's an incredible analysis of it because i think i'm a better manager or better ceo of the production side because of the tech activity you know I'm a lot more analytical in terms of um i think i've always been pretty good at accepting failure and brushing failure off um because if you're not, and I've got the saying that, you know, in TV, you've got to love a no because you get too many of them to not love them. And uh, they, they can be incredibly demoralizing. <laughs> and But um, I think no is one of the most powerful things in, in our game. But to go back to the tech side um, uh, is that I find it incredibly confronting, like tech. It's so honest. It's so brutal because it either is or it isn't. It's not like TV. It's like there's a lot of maybes in yeah. TV. Well, some people liked it. It's like, yeah. no, no that's one right. liked it. No yeah. one liked it. That's right. <laughs> it's just wrong. That's yeah. right. And, and they are, yeah. like you said, it's yeah. just when you're an outsider and you go into a, a situation of a room full of developers, you're like, wow, they're talking to each other in such a um, straight up manner. And, and it's like, uh, so, you know, I think it's, um, there's a lot to be learned from the tech sector. Ah, that, that's so cool. And like, when you, you know, you're talking about being the CEO and the business side of it and the like, like, had you set out to be a, a CEO? What have you had to learn to become a business person and make those choices, like to diversify your company in the face of uh, declining income? Or, or you, you know, what have you yeah. had to, how have you leveled up along the way? That's a really, really good question. And um, I probably need a lot longer to, to give you the best answer. But I do think that I never set out to be a CEO. Um, but what I've learned is that, and uh, I mean, it's it's an old cliche, but when you're passionate about something, you, you you know, you're not working a day in your life. You know, I love it. It's uh, <laughs> I'm in the most uh, amazing position I could ever wish to be in. And um, I've got a saying, and I know we'll talk a little bit about sayings, but one saying I live my life by is, you know, in order to be great, you have to be grateful. And I'm not saying I'm great, but what I do know is I'm incredibly grateful. Um, and... Uh, I, I said earlier, I'm quite quite spiritual. What I meant, I guess, is I'm quite in touch with my Māori um, side mm. and 
my Māori heritage and my whakapapa and just the role that that's played um, in me. So, no, I never set out to be a CEO. And I guess I, I do trust a whole lot of uh, intangible things like my gut instinct or, um, you know, my my hunch on something and, and things like that. Where... It, and even in tech, I think that with all the analysis and analytics that can go on, I still think that, that if you have a look at businesses that really um, go to the next level, mm. it, it still requires a, a hell of a lot of instinct oh, yeah. um, and things like that. Well, I well, hope so. Yeah, well, the, the magic of tech is that you can test your instincts and you yes. can refine your gut, you yeah. know? like <laughs> Mate, it is. Yeah. That's, and that's a huge difference. To TV, because, you know, we always question the rating system. Oh, there's not enough, um, you know, people meters in, in the right houses and things like that. Mm. Until you get a show that rates and it's like, oh, the ratings are fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that great. That's great. Perfect. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But, but in tech, you, you, you know that. Like, you know that somebody spent seven minutes in your system and there's a bit like, and then they're, you know, 80% is only spending 70 mi- seven minutes and what's wrong? Yeah, they, what, fall, they fall off here. They well, fall off here. Let's concentrate on this. That's right, that's right. And all of that, you know, becomes incredibly uh, useful data to you. And and I was somewhere recently where um, Netflix were, gave a presentation and they basically f- found, you know, from all the people that watched their platform, they were like, um, unlikable male leads were king and drug documentaries. So they commissioned Narcos. And I was like, wow, wasn't that powerful? Yeah. You know, and Narcos is the series that's uh, based on Pablo Escobar. And so it was like... Uh, He's pretty unlikable too. That's right. Yeah, He's yeah. pretty un- But But the mere fact that, you know, you had that kind of science or that kind of, uh, I guess it's science, but, you know, that kind of, um, you know, that, those kind of analytics that can tell you that. I was like, wow, that's powerful. Let's look at some of those expressions and like, you know, do you have, um, you, you know, a business philosophy or business books or sayings you go back to or particular mentors? Like, yeah. how, how do you um, yeah, how do you access more for business? Well, I guess, um, you know, um, in, in terms of mentors, probably when I look back at my life, three, my dad, because he was a hard worker, sharer, East Coast, um, you know, work hard, play hard. So... I definitely got the work hard and probably too much of the play hard from him. Um, Jim Mather, um, who was an incredible um, CEO at Maori TV, um, he, you know, provided the stability the organisation needed firstly, but then secondly, after that sort of period of stability, he, um, you know, provided the right environment to grow and we went through some incredible growth. Uh, And then obviously Julie Christie, who on an international level has probably been our most successful um you know export of intellectual property so i had some uh, amazing mentors um like i said i mean i i I was a i am an incredible reader of um, books motivational sports biographies anyone that comes to my house will see and those are not even half of them um so i do a lot of reading but a friend of mine said about 18 months ago you know, Bailey, like, I always say, oh, you should read this book. Blah, blah, blah. And she said to me, stop reading and start writing your own. Uh-huh. And uh, I was like, it, I was sort of a little bit put out at, initially. And then I thought about what she said. And because and, I would always say to her, oh, but such and such said they did this or such and such said they did that. And she was like, who gives a rat's ass? They, do, they weren't reading someone's book. What will be in your book? What are some of the things that really see um, you through? Always talk to the person next to you. <laughs> on a on a plane or a bus um, or a train, um, I'm a big believer in people. You know, I'm a people watcher. Um, I love people. You know, I love being around people. Um, I went, you know, for the float therapy. Have you seen those float pods? Um, it was my birthday yesterday, so you know, um, my partner bought me one of those um, float therapy sessions, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, it killed me not to do nothing for an hour, you know? Like, I'm, I, I love people. I love, you know, you close the pod and you float on salt water and it's like, uh, this ain't actually that cool. Oh, where's someone to talk to? Like, uh, okay, I, get, I get really impatient at yoga. I know the feeling. That's right, that's right. I guess the foray into the tech sector has been interesting that it can be impersonal. 
Um, but I still think that in terms of managing a team, a sales force, um, interaction with customers and things like that, that there's still enough sort yeah. of uh, human interaction for my, you know, for me to get my fix. And in terms of like um, the pathways to becoming a CEO, you know, you hadn't seen yourself as a CEO. Are there enough ways um, for a kid from Rotoria to become a CEO of a tech company in Auckland? You know, like, or yeah. does it have to be in Auckland? Or, you know, what, what do you no, think I of don't. the setup? I think that's one of the cool things with tech is that it doesn't have to be. But, and what the, I guess what the web gives us is, what the internet gives us is, you know, access to the world. You know, I'm a big believer that our our kids um, need tech. You know, they need access to it. They need to understand it, how to use it to its, um, you know, to its fullest. So I'm really encouraging of of, of trying to get tech into to kids' hands, and and um, and I think that that's probably the easiest pathway for kids to become the architects of their own self determination. Because I guess that's kind of what we all want in life, right? Is yeah. To be our own boss, or um, and you know you can be the CEO of Simon Pound Inc. Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 that is is you know going to be incredibly fulfilling. So I think you know as we move forward, businesses might just be one person. Can't wait to see how Kaha goes. It's um, yeah, yeah. It's just so awesome. Karawe yeah. to see it out. Karawe, that's world. right, that's right, and that's <laughs> that's Maori language week, and so. Another, I'll give put another Maori word out there. It's uh, kahasoftware.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, haere ki reira. Go there, tittle here, have a look, and then raweke here uh, and have a play around. So, and contact us and, yeah. and we'll hook you up. H- have a look at it on your computer. What, what's the um, thinking stone was the, um, the, the transliteration, isn't it? Oh, uh, no. Well, rorohiko is, yeah. is computer. So, um, and it's actually Roro, it's it's electric brain. Mm. So um, yeah, I just want to make a differentiation between electric brain and electric puha. Yeah. Uh, electric, <laughs> <laughs> electric puha was 1980s, yeah. but uh, electric brain is is I guess the literal translation of um, uh, what a computer is, which in a funny way I guess is probably about right, right? Yeah. Ah, that's so cool. Well, thank you for coming on and talking to us today, and look forward to seeing where it goes. Awesome. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Simon. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From The Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.